So it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker this afternoon, Dr. James Tomlinson. James is a consultant nephrologist at Imperial College NHS Trust, and he's going to tell us about his work in the field of transplantation. James. Good afternoon. Um, so, pleasure to be here, and uh, hopefully you can stay awake in your soporific mood uh, just after lunch. But um, So, we, we just spent 20 plus minutes just going through what the relevance of uh, IgA nephropathy is in kidney transplantation. So, what have I got? This doesn't work. So, uh, just a, a quick overview of what, what, how I'll cover it in three parts, really. So, why transplantation? Why do we need to think about it and when? <coughs> Uh, what does transplantation involve? And what does transplantation mean specifically for people with IGA nephropathy? And so I think probably by the fact that you're, you're here, uh, I think you grasp the basics of what the kidney function uh, does uh, for functions for your body. Now, um, it's, it's multi, multifold and varied. Um, obviously, the kidneys produce urine. It can tr control the fluids we get rid of out of our bodies, the excess fluids, and also the excess uh, metabolic waste and toxins. Um, by doing that, it controls, very tightly controls the level of acidity in our body in different compartments and also looks after the bone health by controlling various hormones that control your bone turnover, the bone strength, and obviously um, and how, how strong they are and obviously reparation of bone as well. And then finally, um, many of you will know that the kidney produces a hormone called erythropoietin, which is something often uh, abused by athletes, especially the cyclists, but something that's been uh, transformed renal medicine in the last 20 odd years um, because it enables um, giving that EPO in kidney failure and enables us to um, uh, treat the anemia. Now, so when the kidneys fail, you can see quickly why uh, certain events happen. So we have problems with fluid balance. We often get swelling uh, that collects in the ankles and also the lungs. Um, we feel unwell, non-specifically unwell often with uh, itching, uh, a bit of malaise and a bit of lethargy um, and lack of sleep or inability to sleep with a lot of the toxins and waste that build up. Our bones get weak, the turnover is abnormal and we have an increased risk of fractures. Um, and we've become very anemic, so this is just uh, showing the, the, the paleness or pallor that we can see in the, in the mucous membranes around the eye when anemia is there. Now, fortunately, uh, albeit there's about 10% of the population uh, thereabouts have chronic kidney disease, but a very small percentage of those, those patients would uh, progress to end-stage renal disease. Um, in IJ nephropathy, the general rule of thumb is seen as um, those since the time of diagnosis, about one in 10 people may progress to end-stage renal disease in uh, 10 years. And the, uh, an easy to remember rule of thumb is about 20% at 20 years. So those are the general ballpark figures of progression of renal disease related to IgA nephropathy. Um, this is using um, UK renal registry data in the table on the left. You can see that the biggest cause of end-stage renal disease across the board is diabetes. And in America, that's approaching well, it's well, well in excess of 50% now. Now, um, below that is glomerular nephritis, of which only a small proportion of that is IgA nephropathy. So what are the options? If you uh, are, or if one is going um, progressively advancing kidney disease, going towards end-stage renal disease, what are the options? And so we start thinking about things like dialysis. And there are different ways of performing dialysis. One is hemodialysis, where your blood is, is washed of toxins and the excess fluid is taken out. And that's a treatment that usually is three times a week for about four hours in a center that can perform hemodialysis. And some patients can learn to do that at home, provided they have the, the motivation and the space at home to do that, then that can be performed at home. Equally, peritoneal dialysis is another form of dialysis that can also be done at home, where um, fluid is, is put into the abnormal cavity. And the, the, um, the lining of your uh, peritoneum can act as a membrane to allow that exchange of fluid and toxins. Some people, often the more frail, sometimes more elderly patients, would choose what we call conservative care. So um, as with advancing kidney disease, you can get some symptoms that can be controlled with various medicines, and they would choose not to dialyze for various, for various reasons. And that is an option, and often it can allow a better quality of life in their advancing years. But by far and away, the, the best approach for, um, for kidney failure, for end-stage renal disease, uh, and to treat that to allow better outcomes is transplantation. I'm afraid the figure hasn't really come up well there, but that's a, supposed to depict a kidney I, I being donated into uh, the recipient, obviously. 
So just to recap, so what are the advantages of renal transplantation over everything else? Now, you can imagine dialysis is a very artificial and superficial form of renal replacement therapy, as we call it. So um, going intermittently into dialysis, you know, or having intermittent dialysis is nowhere near as having a natural, normal kidney functioning there, second to second, minute to minute. So you can imagine that the overall control of all the fluids and the toxic waste is a lot better. The bone health is, is uh, dramatically improved after, after transplantation, as is the anemia, and rarely uh, you need to continue on EPO after transplantation. Um, one of the very few graphs I've put into this talk um, is, I think it's quite descriptive in many ways. Um, this is a big observational study from the US of A, um, showing the overall benefit. This is not IGA-specific. This is just generally the transplantation uh, benefit overall. So what they did is they had two groups. One, those that were transplanted, and two, uh, over 46,000 people on dialysis but on the transplant waiting list, so effectively fit enough to receive a transplant. And you can see this dotted line across here, and this is above the line is an increased risk of death, and below the line is a decreased risk of death. So over time, on the, on the bottom axis here, you can see at the start, um, you have close to three, threefold risk of death, and that's largely attributed to uh, the, the, its major surgery, anesthetic risk, and the complications therein. But that dramatically falls down uh, over a short space of time, well within three months. Um, the risk is dramatically reduced, um, and actually, on, in the longer term benefit, is it becomes quite clear that 50 to 80 percent increased uh, or improved mortality imp or improved survival, shall I say, with transplantation against those people that uh, remain on dialysis. And how do we assess people for transplantation? So there are various criteria. Age is not really one of them. So yes, of course, we pay attention to age, but it's, it's not really a barrier to transplantation. It's really depending on the person, the individual, and how fit they are. Um, gender, ethnicity are, are certainly not an issue in terms of being assessed for transplantation. Um, but the important considerations are, are you fit enough to undergo a major operation and, and uh, go through the recovery period afterwards? Um, are, are, is the person able to manage uh, living with the transplant themselves? Are they fit enough to get themselves to the appointments? Can they take the medicines? Uh, do they, can they have the capacity to understand uh, why it's important to take the medicines? Other medical conditions, obviously very important. How strong is your heart? Do your lungs work well? Um, and are you very, very vulnerable to infections? And have you had any cancer? So all of these are, are taken into careful consideration. And there's no, there are rarely absolutes. It's really down to the individual about whether they would be potentially a good candidate for transplantation. Um, and the workup um, period is anything between three and six months. So once it's decided that um, transplantation would be um, uh, advisable and feasible, then um, we can work through the process and in, in, it should be well within six months. Now, how to get a kidney? There are two ways of, of, um, of getting a kidney, two ways of donating a kidney. So one is a live donor, which is the preferred option because that can be a planned procedure. Um, and that can be a live related, so that's a fam obviously from a family member. Uh, live unrelated um, is uh, perfectly possible and, and, uh, and preferable overall, um, either from a friend or a, a partner. And uh, there's an increasing um, uptake of uh, altru altruism in terms of um, people that decide they want to donate a kidney. They're not um, in close contact with someone that they know who needs a kidney, but they're more than happy to put it into the pool. And that, was, that is obviously coordinated through the same service uh, to match the most appropriate person in the country on the waiting list. Um, clearly, there's very rigorous testing to make sure the donor is uh, effectively undiseased, they're so-called normal. Um, so we need to be very careful that we're not going to put them at a great disadvantage from it by putting them through an operation um, and um, living with one kidney. Um, there are lots of advantages to this process against deceased donor transplantation, and that's largely because it's planned. So it's, it's, under, uh, it's in a timely fashion. There's lots of pre-planning. You can um, eke out what the possible considerations are for those, for those individuals before surgery. Um, and there's no question there's better long-term survival in uh, kidneys that are donated in this way. The second is disease, deceased donor transplantation, whereby um, organs are harvested from a person who's met an untimely and often from, for example, a road traffic accident or having a stroke. Um, and patients are, potential recipients are listed by NHS uh, Blood and Transplant uh, Service, and they, they're the coordinating body who um, would um, 
uh, hold the register and also perform the matching and uh, look after the logistics of making it happen on the day. Um, obviously, the consent of the family of the, of the deceased is, is sought um, and um, the kidneys are therefore matched to someone on the matching list in the country. So it can, the kidneys are transported across the country. And so the average waiting time on that waiting list is about two and a half years. Um, it's based on many factors, but um, some of the uh, more um, prominent factors are waiting time, your blood group, your tissue type, so what kind of proteins are on your um, blood cells and your tissue on your other cells um, that defines uh, whether you'd be a good match for a kidney or not. And clearly age is important. So for instance, if a kidney is uh, donated from a 70-year-old person, um, it's not ideal to put that into a 20-year-old recipient because you expect um, a longer life expectancy in the, in the recipient. So you want to have them as age-matched as possible. Um, but obviously that's down to the individual case as well. Um, and what we find, certainly in West London, as in many inner-city areas, there's a, there's a mixed population. Um, so a lot of our... Uh, um, potential transplant recipients are from other countries, which, if you think about it, if our donor pool is largely, still in our country, is largely Anglo-Saxon or, 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 or British Caucasians, um, that means that the people dying would have a very different tissue type to the people potentially wanting a kidney in, in some parts of London especially, but obviously in, in other uh, inner city populations. So that can limit um, your chances of getting a transplant in, in X amount of time. It can, re it can lengthen the time you're waiting on the list. So the actual transplant operation, I know um, some people have uh, been um, through the process um, and um, know this all too very well, um, but certainly in IGA nephropathy, your kidneys wouldn't be taken out ordinarily. Your own kidneys would remain in, and you receive usually one kidney. Some centres are doing uh, two kidney transplantations. That's often when there's a size mismatch. So um, if there's a paediatric donor uh, into, a, into an adult, sometimes two kidneys would go in. But by and large, it's one kidney that you get in addition to your um, failing or failed kidneys which stay in. Um, it's uh, put into the pelvis um, and attached um, to the artery, to the vein, and to the ureter, which is the pipe leading from the kidney to the, um, uh, the ureter plugs into the bladder. Um, the mean time of the admission is about a week, uh, give or take a couple of days, depending on progress. And um, the, the thing to note is clearly in clinic, you'll be seen every um, two or three times a week um, with quite intensive follow-up to look at, well, overall, how you're doing. Um, are you drinking the right amount? Are you um, uh, coping with the pain and, and the wound healing and uh, what the blood test is showing in terms of kidney function. And you've monitored extremely closely because um, there is quite a bumpy phase and the kidney function can change according to how much you're drinking and various other factors. So we monitor that very closely. Um, and then towards the three-month mark is when things tend to settle um, and then um, I think the, the longest we'd uh, wait before seeing you again is every three to four months in clinic when things are all well and good. Um, many people um, re are returned to work by three months, um, but it's a big process. Um, it's not to be underestimated, but overall the, the longer term gain is, is very much greater than remaining on dialysis, so it's, it's certainly a, a worthwhile investment for many people. Importantly, it's, uh, after you're transplanted, went to your home, that is the time when, when people really have to take uh, control of, of their own care. So, um, uh, looking at medicines is one of the key aspects, really, and, and uh, understanding what the medicines are and understanding what the side effect profiles are and how to uh, manage those. Um, so this really splits up the, the types of medications into four different groups, really. So the key thing is the anti-rejection. So these are the immunosuppressants that are used to dampen down your immune system to prevent your immune system attacking the kidney that's a, effectively a, a, foreign, um, a foreign body. So the Prednisolone, the steroids, things like tacrolimus and uh, mycophenolate can all be used and are very helpful to dampen down the immune system. Uh, blood vessel health, as ever, in any kind of kidney disease is, is hugely important. Um, so um, there's lots of um, strict attention to controlling the blood pressure, um, using blood thinners to avoid clotting, in the, especially the small vessels, and um, controlling your lipids and your cholesterol. Um, certainly, if you're, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if you're diabetic, then um, optimal control of that is always um, preferable. And you'd be put on lots of medications, uh, including things to dampen down the uh, stomach acid and prevent indigestion. Because we're dampening, dampening down your immune system, um, we do use agents to um, help prevent uh, infections with viruses 
and also with bacteria and, and often certainly in the initial phases after the transplant would give you those kind of um, agents to reduce the chances of infection. So the, there's a lot going on but clearly throughout the whole process people are, uh, are counseled very well and uh, we have a strong presence of pharmacists in each clinic often as well to, to help people through that. So this is in general again, so not necessarily specific to IJ nephropathy, how long does the transplant last? So some can last well in excess of 30 years. There's clearly a huge spectrum from suddenly immediate failure from a surgical, perhaps a surgical complication, very rarely fortunately, all the way up to uh, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, now those causes of failure are obviously uh, large and wide from the surgical complications um, but a, some form of rejection, either acutely or over time, is always a, a greater risk. So that's why one of the reasons why we monitor you very closely in clinic. Um, clearly relevant to this, uh, this uh, information day is IgA disease, and we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, and sadly, some people's graphs that do fail um, do require going back, back to dialysis or starting dialysis. Um, but certainly, retransplantation is completely possible and it is done. Um, clearly um, with um, lots of, um, lots of pre-planning. But we're looking at around um, an 80 to 90% um, good kidney function or, or um, achievable kidney function within five years, but sadly over time that does drop off uh, as the natural um, um, reduction in graft function. Now, specific to IgA <coughs> disease, um, I think there's important um, things to consider in... in a population with IgA as opposed to those a mixed bag of, say, diabetic nephropathy or any other causes. So um, people with IgA entering the, the, uh, the realm of having to have a transplant tend to be younger and they tend to be healthier because they don't often have coexisting diabetes and various other conditions that have led, towards, uh, led them towards end-stage renal disease. So a lot of this is on observational studies, uh, largely US, but there's a couple of very good um, Australian and New Zealand uh, registry data uh, producing a lot of informative numbers in terms of, um, uh, in terms of IGA in, in transplantation. Um, so certainly um, people with IGA um, tend to have an increase, uh, they're more likely to have a live donor uh, transplant. Uh, certainly the wait list time, if they're on the waiting list, the wait list time is shorter. Um, and uh, one of the U.S. studies suggested that if you're on dialysis with IgA waiting for a kidney, you're almost at 15 times greater in the first year of getting a transplant than someone who hasn't got IgA nephropathy. Um, so once the kidney's been transplanted, are you likely to get IgA coming back in the new kidney? Um, and the bottom line answer is yes, it's fairly common, but there's a whole spectrum of how severe and, and and what that disease um, really manifests in, in terms of uh, severity. Um, so what we measure in clinic for anybody, and especially in IGA, clearly looking at the, um, the blood test according to serum creatinine, which is a, a surrogate marker of kidney function, um, urine dipsticks and measuring protein, how much protein in the urine, um, and also fundamentally if we're concerned about any change, <coughs> In this, then, we'd be looking at kidney biopsy, so getting a small piece of kidney to identify what's happening to the cells in the kidney themselves. And that's really, obviously, the gold standard to define any kind of um, disease in the kidney, and specifically with the IgA reoccurrence. Um, and so what uh, many studies have found, a varying range of um, reoccurrence in graphs, but when they're uh, looking at the biopsy cohorts, they see about uh, a recurrence in about 60%. Now, many of those actually haven't got any significant disease. The, the blood function, the blood uh, creatinine according to function doesn't change. Some of them don't even have any dipstick positivity. So there's a whole spectrum of uh, reoccurrence that go to uh, from subclinical, i.e. not detectable in any other, other way, to um, quite aggressive disease. Um, and so while that number 60% is alarming, I think we have to understand the context. So those people at high risk of reoccurrence in the kidney transplant uh, are those with their primary disease in their native kidneys being more aggressive and more abrupt. Um, but interestingly, it's, it's, as ever, it's a, it's a complex disease. So in the same patients, and these are obviously small numbers in some studies, but in some patients that are repeatedly trans, uh, transplanted on their second or third kidneys, they don't necessarily run the same course. So I think if otherwise uh, feasible, it's still worthwhile considering uh, retransplantation, even despite uh, losing, losing the first graft to IgA nephropathy. Um, 
interestingly, just I think um, Danny Gale's talk um, coming up will go through the genetics of IgA nephropathy, but there's clearly uh, a signal in a lot of the observational studies where we see those people at higher risk are also those people receiving a live related donor, and if the, the matching is especially good, if it's especially close, interestingly, you have a chance of um, uh, reoccurrence. Um, some people have uh, suggested that actually monitoring IgA levels um, post-transplantation, um, if those are especially high, you do have a higher risk against those people that have undetectable or, or normal range IgA in their bloodstream. And others, there's been one large study and, and several others to support this um, um, idea that actually patients being bought off steroids entirely run a higher risk of having IgA recurring in their graft. Um, depending on the center, some um, transplant centers will keep you on a low dose of prednisolone long term and some will try and get you off that. Um, and it depends on the local protocols. However, those that are taken off steroids tend to look like they have a slightly higher risk of uh, recurrence. And so, if it does recur, what can you do? Um, so, there is little evidence to suggest uh, or to guide doctors and um, people with IgA about what best to do in terms of changing the medic medicines. So, um, all the immunosuppression that has been tried in native IgA disease has also been tried in, um, in transplantation and reoccurrence. Um, with varying success. So there's always case reports of, of, of great success, um, but in, in, in bigger studies, the, the signal isn't necessarily straightforward. Uh, people have also tried tonsillectomy um, pre-transplantation um, pre to reduce the risk, and that seems to have no great effect. Um, and the steroid effect, as I've said before, um, there seems, seems to be some indication that's, that's a real effect. As always, ACE, in, ACE inhibitors, so the blood pressure medications that are good for blood pressure but seem to have an anti-inflammatory effect as well, um, they're also um, shown to be um, useful in the progression of IgA in the graft. Um, but overall, I think it depends on the individual case and how aggressive the disease is about what may be chosen as an Im immunosuppression to, to try and treat that reoccurrence. Um, and an important thing is, over across all the observational studies, there's the, the outcomes are not that dissimilar in transplantation compared to people with non-IGA disease. Um, and I'll just show you this slide. So um, I'll talk you through these graphs. What we have is, uh, this is an Italian study of, of 200 patients with IGA nephropathy being transplanted. And, f and the comparator group was about 400 patients without IGA nephropathy. So, nephropathy. so that was a mixed bag of diabetes and, and various other diseases. Um, the dotted line is, is the patients with the um, IgA nephropathy. So you see the top left in graph A, um, this is uh, patient survival. So this is the, the survival of the, of the person themselves. And there's no significant difference. You can see a separation, but that's not um, significant. So there seems to be no obvious effect on long-term patient survival between the groups. If you look on the bottom left at B, um, you can see this is now graph survival. So this is survival of the kidney. Um, and there starts to be a separation between those people with IgA and those people um, with um, non-IgA disease in that um, over time, especially over 15 years, there starts to be a separation where, whereby those people with IgA nephropathy are more likely um, to lose their to function in their graft. An interesting, oh, another interesting finding in the study, actually, was there seems to be a changing uh, incidence of um, IgA recurrence in transplants over time. So um, if, if you were transplanted in the 1980s and then the 1990s and in the year 2000s, you have a, a, a decreased risk of uh, reoccurrence. So what they're finding is that, um, at least in this study, that their reoccurrence in, in the graft of IgA was going down over time. And that suggests it's probably related to the changing protocols of immunosuppression at the start of transplantation and then the maintenance. And so uh, it's very difficult in a relatively small study to unpick exactly which agent may be better, um, but there is certainly a suggestion there. So, so the, there clearly is a response uh, to different uh, regimes of immunosuppression uh, with regards to recurrence. So I'll finish off with just with some take-home messages, really. Um, End-stage kidney disease can occur, and it does occur, fortunately, in a minority of people with IgA nephropathy. Um, transplantation, by and large, is the treatment of choice for longevity and quality of life. Um, and there are huge benefits, um, and this is across the board in kidney disease, about planning early. So, as always, a preemptive transplantation is so much better uh, than going through transplantation after <coughs> having to need to start dialysis. So, that word preemptive really means before the need to start um, dialysis. 
And remember, there are always options. So I think um, along every step of the way, so obviously be sure to discuss it with the teams, um, nephrologists and all the um, uh, specialist nurses and anyone who's involved in, in your care. I think I'll finish there. I think in order to stick to time, I think we just time for one question. Um, so we've got a question uh, from people watching at home. Um, they ask, can people with IgA and people who've had kidney transplants drink alcohol? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but so, as, so as not to fall over, I think. But no, I think um, the general advice, the advice would be the same. Um, so yes, uh, always in moderation and um, under the um, recommended limit, which I forget the numbers for these days. <laughs> One more? Yeah, okay, one more, and then we can carry on. Um, and someone else has asked, um, what happens if you react to tablets? If you can't take tablets specifically, <laughs> are there other ways you can uh, take the drugs that you need? Uh, as always, with, with any medicine, I think it's important to understand exactly why people can't ta take tablets. Are the tablets too big? Uh, is it a, a, a more, sometimes people have trouble swallowing anything foreign that's not food. Um, so I think it really depends on the scenario. Um, but as I said on the last slide, that there are always options. So I think just talk through what the issues are and whether it's down to a specific tablet and then um, there are often alternatives uh, and different even preparations of medicines as well. Okay, thanks very much, thank you.